Hello geeks and gamers, Matt Lemke here with your Gamer Goggles and we're at the Steve Jackson Games booth at Origins Game Fair 2014. And I have uh, my first opportunity ever actually to interview John Cavallic, but I'm going to have to apologize to you. It's going to be pretty short because time is, well, scrunched right now. And it's Gen Con. It's, it is Gen Con. It's a time warp. The Gen Con time warp oh. gets very scrunched. So John is probably a household gaming name. <laughs> Probably. I mean, you know, you, you. I am the bleach of gaming. <laughs> the household crew. Wow. I, I wouldn't say that's cleaner. I mean, you. Tied. You the tied of gaming. That, that's better. You bring out a lot of color. <laughs> oh, well played, sir. Well thank played. you. Thank you. Um, you got your start. Man, I, I seem to remember stuff about Dork Tower going back many years. Uh, we had our 15th anniversary a few years ago. Yeah, you started uh, in Dragon Magazine, right? Actually, no, I started in um, Shadis, uh, the Alderac magazine. I didn't uh, even know that existed, but I was a slow gamer. <laughs> I'm a very slow gamer. It's, uh, you would not believe. Um, yeah, so Shadis magazine was published by Alderac Entertainment um, as a general gaming role playing magazine. And it started in their uh, late 1990s, maybe. Oh, I thought it was even earlier than that. It, you know, actually, it might have been. I'm trying to. It was. I was dating my wife at the time, so it's. It's. I, it's boy, a family. Yes. These things just. Uh, that's they okay. All blur together. That's not that. That's not really that important. But you know, what's important is you found the geek pop culture thing. You're kind of like a founder to all of it, really, in many ways. That's that's very kind. <laughs> well, I mean, in a it's, way, you know, you started this comic strip that really kind of reminds me a lot of um, Calvin and Hobbes meets, um, what's his name? Um, I want to say Simon and Garf Garfunkel. But <laughs> anyway. The, the, Calvin the, and Hobbes meets Simon and Garfunkel uh, for the was, craziest concert. It, it's really kind of like light and satirical. Uh, hopefully, most of the humor is... Um, it, it, reflective, it, reflective on me and you know my hobbies and my past. And that that's, time. See, that's what I, I strive my blog to be a reflection of gaming meets real life, which you have so accomplished. It's, uh, it's I, I was very fortunate. I was kind of in the right place at the right time. Literally, when one of the editors of Shade is asked me if I wanted to come up with a new comic strip, and I, it was a Gen Con actually, um, and it actually might have been. 95 um, or so, and from walking from the shade, from the Alderac booth to the exit at Gen Con, I had the idea for the four basic characters. I mean, Carson the Muskrat wow. comes from my old comic strip, Wildlife, which a long time ago was syndicated uh, nationally um, by Chronicle Features, and uh, the rest of them were very easy to come up. I just based them on my gaming group. So there is actually an Igor out there, and he's a great friend of mine, and he's actually crazier than he is in the comic strip. Uh, he just does incredibly, you know, insane moves uh, in a role-playing session. That's just nuts. It is. I actually have, the fact that I've got it dialed down the character in the comic well, strip is... How crazy. did you end up doing, like, all the Pathfinder art for Steve Jackson? Um, I was really, really fortunate. Um, before Dork Tower started, Steve Jackson had seen one of my editorial cartoons in the Wisconsin State oh, Journal. Really? Somebody, so that was first. That was first. Um, somebody had clipped, I was an editorial cartoonist. Somebody had clipped one of my editorial cartoons and sent it to um, Steve down in Austin. And it, it, it mentioned the Bavarian Illuminati. Uh, because it was a, it was a conspiracy cartoon about the O.J. Simpson trial. Somebody, had, one of his O.J. Simpson's that lawyers, had said there's a conspiracy to get O.J. So me being an editorial cartoonist and a gamer, I did this big conspiracy thing, and I just for the heck of it threw in the Bavarian Illuminati. And it would have been about '92. '93, uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, then, then about so. And so Steve, Steve saw this and asked me if I wanted to draw the feature Murphy's Rules. Uh, which was running in Pyramid Magazine, which was a favorite of mine. Murphy's Rules was, is a comic, it's still going, uh, Pyramid Online. Uh, Greg Highland, my good friend, is now drawing that. But it's a comic about taking the excesses of rules and illustrating them. Like, you know, some, a rule which may make sense in a game, but if you translate that to real life, it's just incredibly ridiculous. 
Some of them will be because of misprints. Some of them will be just because of bad rules. Um, so I started illustrating that, and uh, which is also how I then hooked up with. Uh, actually, no. Then I asked Steve um, about a year later. Uh, Steve Jackson Games was putting out the Illuminati board game, New World Order. Sorry, the Illuminati collecting card game. And I was a Magic the Gathering player. I called up Steve um, and I asked, do you have any extra cards you need drawn? And fortunately for me, they had about 20 cards remaining that they wanted me to fill in on. So that was my first professional actual gaming gig, was about 20 cards in Illuminati New World Order. Um, this actually led to me being a part of out-of-the-box games and then producing apples to apples because some of the guys from out of the box saw Illuminati, saw that I was an artist in Madison and called me about this game that they were wanting to publish. At the same point in time, Steve got back in touch with me saying we have this game called Shea Geek. Would you like to uh, draw this? And I was blown away. So it's safe to say when the gaming industry decides they like you, they like you. Um, it was great good fortune. Uh, it was and like a series of very strange coincidences, almost Illuminati-like, in fact, these coincidences. Um, and then Shea Geek was a lot of fun, and Steve came up with the Munchkin game. And he asked me if I wanted to illustrate that. And so this was the first time when I was illustrating a game, Steve Jackson, a hero of mine from gaming. I've been playing Steve Jackson games since Ogre and GEV. He asked me to work on his game. And this still, I, I um, can't quite believe that. And Munchkin clicked, and now I've drawn... 5,000 cards, Munchkin cards since then. Uh, uh, wow, wow. And that, that, wow, 5,000 <laughs> unique pieces of art for Munchkin. It's been over like a 12 year period of time. Still, but that's, that's a lot uh, of art. Yes. So, but you don't just do Munchkin though, then. You do some stuff that's more serious, clearly, because that's how you started. I don't anymore. Now, I'm, I mean, I'm much happier doing uh, the cartoony styles. That's what I want to do. That's what I'm happiest doing. Occasionally, I might take on something else just to try and stretch myself. Every time I do, I invariably regret it, and I'm so happy to get back to Munchkin. It's, you know, Munchkin always makes me uh, just enormously happy to draw. So what kind of... What What's probably your favorite piece then? I mean, I know we don't have anything here to show you, but... Uh... Um, my favorite piece is usually from the game I've just finished. So, oh, really? that's, yeah. That's um, good. It, so, for example, like, I loved this cover I got to draw from Munchkin Panic. Um, and that was a lot of fun. When I get a chance to do a cover, like the Munchkin Pathfinder cover, I loved doing that because I got a few days to work on that. It was a larger piece. I could get more involved. Normally when the Munchkin cards uh, are, are due, the deadline is very quick. I've got to get them done fast and on deadline, and Munchkin's got to get out on deadline. It's uh, something I'm very proud of, uh, is hitting those real short, real tense deadlines. It comes from my newspaper background when you had to work on these type deadlines. Uh, but yeah, if I've got a couple of days, I think the Munchkin Pathfinder cover, I just love doing that the Munchkin Legends cover. There is actually um, the Munchkin Pathfinder uh, supplement, uh, Gobsmack, uh, the little 15 card, 16 card booster. There's a card in there, speaking of um, the classic comic, Calvin Hobbes. There's a, there's a card in there called the Hobbes Goblin, which is a... Yes, yeah, so a, a really good card. goblin who looks a little bit like a cartoon character we may be familiar with. He's got a little stuffed animal under his arm. I don't know who that would be. And I had a huge amount of fun with that. I'm, I can look back at my stuff from a couple of years ago, and I can see every mistake. I can see things I wish I would have done differently. I would, you know, if I had time, I'd go back and draw stuff. And still learning. I mean, still always. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be a good artist if you weren't looking back and trying to get better. It's it's it, that's part of the fun of the job is trying to see. I mean, I really do try to make every Munchkin game look much better than the last. And I'm normally really happy with how the last one turned out. And the ones about four years ago, it's like, oh, okay, this is what I should have done there. But when I look back at all of them with a critical eye, I, I'm pretty happy. I think for the most part, you know, I've had a lot of fun and I hope it shows in the games. So how much longer do you want to do this? As long as it's fun. It's still fun. It's still... I was, I was seriously... 
working on another project uh, a few months ago. And then the next day I had to go back to Munchkin, and I was so happy to get back to Munchkin. I love having worked with Steve uh, to create this world, and now with Andrew uh, Hackard, who just writes fantastically deranged cards. It's, yeah, sure um, he yeah, so, oh yes he does. They're a true reflection of his personality. Absolutely they are. Um, but it's still enormous fun. I find it uh, just being able to sit down at the drawing table with a blank sheet of paper and come up with four or six monthly cards is tremendous. I I love these characters. I love um, having had a small hand. I love playing in Steve Jackson's sandbox. It's a very fun sandbox to play. It is. I like the motion line. I like... Well, I haven't played too much Ogre, but from what I remember, it was good. It's been a while. Since you know, the new Ogre is fantastic. I actually was, you know, I was not worried because Steve does not do bad games. But I, I, in the back of my mind, when they did the Ogre Kickstarter, my big concern was, is this going to feel like a 1970s game? Because some games don't. I mean, some games do yeah, feel, true. from a design perspective, like a 1980s game or a 1970s game. Game design has changed... But Ogre, the Ogre Designer's Edition is great. I was playing this with my nephew who had never played Ogre. We were playing some of the early scenarios. The Ogre comes chugging down, blows up the base, then is desperately trying to get away from the GVs that are darting in and darting out. And it was fantastic. It was a great experience. And I was so happy to be reliving this little part of my, you know, one of my first gaming experiences, now this huge, gorgeous, deluxe edition that Steve Jackson Games did such a good job releasing the game. That they did. That they did. So what, what kind of goals might you have? Goals? Yeah, for like, I mean, I realize that you don't have like total control of where it goes, but in some ways you do because you get to control the art. Largely. You know, Munchkin is a surprising little game. Um, it's gone so many different places. It's gone, it's gone so many different things. It's it's the little game that could. I mean, it's just remarkable what is you know it's achieved so far. Um, I you know I'm going to be working on the comic book, uh, which is going to be coming out from Boom Studios. I'm going to be helping with that. Um, at some point, it would be delightful. Obviously, I think no, you know, I'd be lying if I you know didn't say it would be terrific to see an animated series. Um, to oh see, wow. I, you know, and these are these are like the big dreams. Um, who knows? It's done so much already. Uh, it's it's just it's it, and it's been surprising because uh, so much of Munchkin is based on these incredibly stupid jokes. And I don't think you know anybody is True. going to say no, no. This this is very clever. It's it's really amazing puns and awful puns and ridiculously funny and people keep coming back for it and, and it translates over the world yeah. I mean it's in what 16 15 16 languages I would have to you I know, didn't know that it's yeah it's it's uh, I just got a Russian version came in the mail um, I, the Chinese version came in the mail do you have more fun with those versions or? They're, they're the same but we, I don't do anything with the translations no, occasionally but, I'll so do, it's the same you could it'd be cool to see the different themes like a, a yeah. Russian uh, uh, instead of the guy with the Viking head he's got a <laughs> Occasionally, when uh, one of our foreign translators will release a game, they'll ask for a couple of special, unique cards. So there are some promo cards out there. Like, I've done a lot of promo cards for the Germans. Um, I've done quite a few for the Dutch, um, the Italians, the Polish uh, Very translators. Cool. I bet those uh, are worth some money on eBay. It's crazy. I, the, wow. the most I've ever seen a Mushroom card go for on eBay is $1,000. And that's a card, uh, the Heart of the Anomaly card, which has got Will Wheaton on it. And they did a thousand cards for a convention, and most of the cards were lost. And because it's Will Wheaton and because it's Munchkin, these are extraordinarily rare. And I really never thought I would see that kind of uh, thing happen to Munchkin. That things like that continue to be shocking and amazing and make me wish I'd kept more of those cards. Yeah. Um, on that note, I think we have to end it. But uh, thank you, John, for your time. It's it was a pleasure. A pleasure. Uh, the First pleasure time, uh, maybe next time in a different show we'll have more time. That would be uh, wonderful. Maybe we'll play Munchkin or something together. That'd be awesome. I would love that. I've only ever won one game of Munchkin. 
Same people, here. Same people here, actually. Really? But I only oh. played twice. <laughs> <laughs> Touche, sir. Touche. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not in my library. percent is your winning. Yeah, percentage. so far. Yeah. In baseball, that would be your king of the home It would be insane. Yes. Um, but thank you guys for watching. Uh, hopefully, this will be up before the end of the show, but wireless is terrible here. <laughs> <laughs> and have a good day. Thanks thank so much. Thank you very much. much. The pleasure is mine.